colonizing space rather than Mars. Science fiction is often fascinated with space travel and interplanetary or even interstellar commerce. The spacefaring characters speak of those living on planetary surfaces as ground pounders, just as sailors used to speak of non-sailors as land lovers. It may be a plot device for science fiction, but as it turns out, being unbound from a single planet is essential for human survival and the continued growth of society. Only in the last few hundred years did we learn that we're in a cosmic shooting gallery full of planet-wrecking asteroids, and getting thousands if not millions of people off-world is the only way to assure our survival. The Best Idea Gerard K. O'Neill was a physicist that recognized the folly of having all of the humans in existence living on a single planet. One big, unexpected space rock, and humanity was done for. Curious, he decided to use his best students in a special project to investigate and to get an answer. Where is the best place for humans to live? He asked his smartest protophysicists. He was as surprised as anyone else at the answer that came back, but the evidence was undeniable. His new position to the scientific community is summed up by this quotation. We should ask, critically and with appeal to the numbers, whether the best site for a growing, advancing industrial society is Earth, the Moon, Mars, some other planet, or somewhere else entirely. Surprisingly, the answer will be inescapable. The best site is somewhere else entirely. That gave him a path to follow for the rest of his life, to promulgate the idea that our space programs were well worth the effort so we could learn how to get lots of people off the planet and where to put them. Humanity could create self-sustaining space habitats in free space that could survive entirely on their own, irrespective of what happened to Earth itself. Speed is of the essence. It'll take centuries or millennia for us to make any planet in our solar system livable like Earth. We could build dozens of space habitats in just a single human lifetime, and the speed increases exponentially as we get more people up there to do the job. The first might take 15 years, but the next two would take only six years, and the next four only three years. Not only would it benefit humanity with new, superior technology, but it would protect humanity from extinction in the event of a catastrophe. We know what happened to the last dominant species that didn't learn to protect themselves. 170 million years of planetary domination abruptly brought to a close. Space Habitats An early colony might be the ball shape for now sphere, first proposed in 1929 that was a mere mile in diameter and capable of housing up to 30,000 people. It was envisioned as a non-spinning sphere because we didn't know about bone loss back then, thus it had no simulated gravity. Modern versions give it a spin, sufficient for Earth normal gravity, which also makes the axial ends uninhabitable due to the slope. The population is thus reduced to about 10,000 people, though terraces up the ends could allow for lower gravity residences for the elderly or infirm to experience near-normal mobility. Bioscience tells us that a small group of 500 individuals will lose most of their genetic diversity in just a few generations. Typically, we need 3,000 to 5,000 individuals for genetic maintenance. So even one small Bernal sphere would be sufficient to save humanity. Saving Crop Diversity Besides providing another place to house valuable plant seeds, as the global seed banks do today, we could grow a lot of food in the habitats to feed the population, and we can have any sort of environment we choose for growing crops, from humid jungle to frozen alpine. Those rings stacked on either end of the Bernal sphere are actually farms. When turned sideways to show the down of artificial gravity, you can see the bottom two layers are for different types of livestock, and the top layer is for crops. Each ring section is about 500 feet wide and 3 miles in length, providing about 2.6 square miles of growing area on each level. Theoretically, one single acre could feed nearly 1,100 people, and there are 1,660 acres available just on the top level. So in theory, that could feed 1.8 million people. Space Cities a population of 10,000 would comprise a large town in a Bernal sphere. 
Next might be a torus, which is like a 3D ring or donut, which is easy to build and well within the capabilities of modern materials. A ring or a pair or a triple wheel with a central hub as an access and a larger diameter would be suitable for many people and have a slower spin than the Bernal sphere, making nausea less likely. Eventually, we'll need much bigger facilities to hold multi-millions of people. A bigger habitat along the lines of O'Neill's Island 3 concept would be a city or a whole country. They could have unique political systems and trade agreements with Earth, Moon, other colonies, or wherever else people have settled. They might decide to be Nordic with permanent winter for skiers. They could be tropical jungles, if that appealed. Their climate could be permanently temperate with no snow or baking heat ever. Any climate is possible in such a colony. Originally, Island 3 consisted of two paired counter-rotating cylinders 20 miles long, which are 4 miles or more in diameter. This provides about 250 square miles from both cylinders, which is 11 times larger than Manhattan Island, crowded home to 1.7 million people. Lots of open land. O'Neill envisioned Island 3 as six valleys. Three were to be aluminum frame glass panels to allow reflected sunlight to enter. The other three were to be made of metal covered with hollow structures and soil to form mountains, lakes, and other geographical features. The lakes would act as reservoirs and aquaculture sites for fish. From the ground, it would look and feel like being on Earth. Standing in one valley, through the clouds, you might notice two more valleys hanging above your head, each 60 degrees apart. Outside of each window would be a full-length mirror that would open and close each day so that the sun would track across the sky for the valley directly opposite. This is because the cylinders would point end-on to the sun, so the majority of radiation shielding could be at that end. The Modern Take Nowadays, we think in terms of windowless cylinders, with passive light tubes bringing in sunlight where desired. With so much available solar-powered electricity, artificial light would prevail everywhere else. This also makes the entire interior available to build on without the complexity of windows and mirrors. If you've ever been five miles up in a plane and looked at the ground, you know that those distances are sufficient to color its sky blue. Indeed, that's the region where clouds form and planes fly through them regularly. That means the habitats will also have real weather. In addition, being able to look for long distances along the axis would give openness to the habitat that was missing from smaller colonies. It wouldn't need to be crowded like Manhattan. However, it could have tall buildings or be all suburbs. More importantly, on a big colony like this, one rotation would be minutes long so people wouldn't get nauseous from the spin while getting Earth normal gravity. That's a risk on smaller colonies with faster spin rates. Survivability Interestingly enough, these habitats are not fixed in place. Once construction is complete, they'll use reaction engines to move to a permanent location. If one day someone discovers an actual threat to a space city, all they have to do is move out of the way. It could take weeks to get any sort of respectable speed, but they'd certainly have more warning than that. More importantly, if someone decided that investigating Titan for its massive seas of petrochemical resources, not for gasoline but for polymers such as plastic, then an entire city could move out there with thousands or millions of workers to produce whatever was needed for anyone in the solar system. Indeed, with nuclear fusion, such a colony wouldn't even need the sunlight for power and could set off on a generational quest to get to another star system. If we don't invent warp drive or some other faster-than-light mechanism, such journeys may be the only way we'll ever get to another star system. The Takeaway Terraforming could take centuries to manifest itself into a usable area for humans to live when we could have dozens or hundreds of space cities before the end of this century. Instead, we should embrace the idea that planets and moons are basically impractical and a waste of time and effort when used as living space. They are instead essentially warehouses for our building materials. We can build more habitats and livable land area than the entire planet Earth possesses for less than the cost of terraforming any one planet. Getting the majority of people off the planet could allow Earth to turn green and revert to a more primitive state if desired. And of course, there will always be those that can't or won't leave 
so the Earth would never be empty.